Hello, hello. How's everyone? The holidays are once again upon us, the time of year when family and food is at the center of our lives. So happy holidays and cheers to everyone. Speaking of food, we are here this evening with food historian Sarah Lohman, whose new book, Endangered Eating, explores food traditions that are in danger of being lost. And how do we save them? As we navigate the holidays full of Vermont food traditions like hot apple cider, pancakes with Vermont maple syrup, mashed gill feather turnips, and our celebrated Vermont cheeses, how do we ensure they continue? Sarah Lohman is originally from Hinckley, Ohio, where she began working in a museum at the age of 16, cooking historical food over a wood-burning stove. She graduated with a BFA from the Cleveland Institute of Art in 2005. For her undergraduate thesis, she opened a temporary restaurant installation that reinterpreted food of the colonial era for the modern audience. Sarah moved to New York City in 2006 and worked as a video producer for her new New York Magazine's food blog, Grub Street. She chronicled her personal explorations in culinary history on her blog, Four Pounds of Flour, from 2008 to 2018. Loman's first book, Eight Flavors, The Untold Story of American Cuisine, was an Amazon bestseller. The Atlantic called it Richly researched, intriguing, and cleverly written, Eight Flavors is currently taught in undergraduate classes at Purdue and Pennsylvania State University. Her second book, Endangered Eating, America's Vanishing Foods, was released by Norton on October 24th of 2023, and the, the edition won an Audi Award for the Best History Title of the Year. Um, so please join us in welcoming Sarah Lohman. Hi there. Um, th I, I think I missed one of my own awards. Did you say that I won an award for best history title of the year? I think I, I think I, that's the wrong book, right? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, great if I did, I wasn't aware. It has No, happened. no, I did. <laughs> Wait, an Oh, uh, well, maybe not. Maybe. Hmm. <laughs> don't worry. It has got the other accolades. It is. One of Amazon's uh, top 100 books of 2023. It's an editor's choice at the New York Times. I actually just found out today that it's one of Milk Streets and Adam Gopnik's uh, best books of the year. Uh, and it is, as of last week, officially James Beard nominated as well. So don't worry. It's, it's Yay! Plenty of awards to go around. And then, you know, hopefully more accolades to come. So hi, Battleboro, Vermont. It's such a pleasure to be here in spirit. We were just talking about the weather because I'm actually calling in from Las Vegas, where it is a beautiful, I think, 62 degrees and sunny. Um, but, you know, I did just spend a whole month out east and in the Midwest. So I've been really looking forward to the sunshine coming home here. So we're going to be, I'm going to give you an overview of my uh, book today, my second book, Endangered Eating, America's Vanishing Foods. We're going to look a little bit of the um, the list that sparked this book. And I just want to encourage you, if you've got any questions, you've got the Q&A option here, pop them in the Q&A and I'll get to them. I would love to hear from you too, especially if you've got some rare local foods that you remember. So my book is based on this online encyclopedic reference called The Arc of Taste. The Arc of Taste is put together by Slow Food International. This is an organization that was founded in the late 1980s in Italy, and it was in direct, direct reaction to an opening of a McDonald's near a famous Roman monument. So um, this idea of like slow food versus fast food, I think they really shaped a lot of the food culture of the 90s and 2000s. Um, but for a long time, the main focus of their work is this arc of taste. Now, uh, we're going to have a little bit of presentation, but I also just want to show you online what I am talking about when I say the arc of taste. Okay. Give me one second here. So when you go online to the Arc of Taste, you could just Google it. It pops up here. It is at Slow Food USA. USA. There is an international catalog that has about 5,000 different entries. And then there's the Arc of Taste in the USA, which has about 400. And they've got their own coffee table book out right now about all of their foods. And what you can find on this list is everything from animals, wild and farmed, and uh, fruits and vegetables, both farmed and fresh too. Um, and even you can see in here a couple of fishes as well. 
So it is kind of searchable and filterable. And so I pulled things from the Northeast region. Um, the entire United States is divided up basically into five different regions. Vermont is in the Northeast. So I pulled a few things um, that are on the American Arc of Taste from the uh, Northeast. Interestingly, a lot of fish, American shad, Atlantic sturgeon, the Gulf of Maine, yellowtail flounder, um, but also we've got some crops like the barsuckle pear, the Harrison lettuce, the Hank's extra special baking bean, which sounds very Massachusetts to me, honestly. But then you can see that there's also wild foods on there like the butternut or the white walnut, not a butternut squash, a butternut, the tree, and the American chestnut, which is extremely rare. Now, as I started looking into foods in the arc of taste, I often found that many of them were disappearing for different regions. Oh man, I'd love to plant some pink plume celery. I, from everything I've read historically, our modern celery is not up to snuff. So I would love to see what a historical celery tastes like too. Um, here's even a chicken on here, here, the Rhode Island red, of, oh, the Rhode Island white, excuse me. Um, so obviously from uh, Rhode Island, as well as things like sassafras, which is common all over the Eastern United States. Interestingly, though, I searched just for Vermont to see if it came up in any of the entries, um, and it did not. So there is definitely a local chapter of slow food. Um, there's at least a statewide one. Often there's city ones, too, or they're associated with university campuses. So if you know of a local rare food, you can definitely get it onboarded to the Arc of Taste. The main advantage here is that, so each one of these will have a little background essay too, tells a little bit about um, who created it, if it's a farm thing, uh, what its cultural heritage is, who it's important to. So there's these beautiful little essays that bring up all of these characters from history. Um, and that is what began to draw me to this. As I went through every single region in the United States, I'd find these stories that just seem to go a little bit deeper. And the one I ended up choosing, although it was actually about multiple things from the Northeast, was uh, the Harrison apple. The Harrison apple was considered one of the finest apples of the 19th century. It's from the Newark area. It was used to make a beverage called Newark cider, which was considered the best hard cider on the planet uh, up until the early 20th century. And then by the mid, the mid 20th century, nobody had even heard of this apple and was believed to be entirely extinct. Then in the 1970s, this guy who wanted to make good cider, his name is Paul Guidez, he started looking at 19th century books, found references to, the, to this amazing cider apple, the Harrison, called around, called the USDA, called orchards, called universities, asking for Harrison apple cuttings, and nobody had even heard of it. So he decided to get in his car and go to New Jersey to look for it. And he stopped at a bagel shop in Livingston, which is a township just outside of Newark, and uh, asked if there were any old orchards or cideries around. And the guy behind the counter said, yeah, there's one right up the road, just go up the hill. So Paul goes up the hill and he finds Nettie Ox Cidery, which uh, was founded in the 1850s. And just behind the building, he can see what looks like a Harrison apple tree based on the descriptions he'd read in 19th century sources. So he knocks on the front door and asks the man who, entered, who answered, you know, do you have any Harrisons? And the guy says, yeah, there's one right there. I'm about to cut it down to make room for my vegetable garden. So Paul goes and takes some cuttings, um, does some grafts back home, plants it in his orchard, finds it's an amazing apple, and so starts planting it around for friends and family as well. It was so easy to find, he didn't realize what he had until nearly a decade later, when he made contact with a very famous pomologist, that's an apple studier, named Tom Burford, who informed him that this was in fact a Harrison apple, and that his father had spent his entire life looking for it, and then Tom had spent his entire life looking for it. Now the Harrison is very much a success story. While it isn't grown in great numbers compared to something like a Red Delicious, any place, any orchard that's growing apples for cider making absolutely has some Harrisons planted in its orchard. I stood in an orchard in Washington state that had 10,000 Harrison apple trees, um, which is amazing when you think we were down to maybe one or two left outside of Newark, New Jersey. Um, but what I think is so exciting about a lot of these is that treasure hunt. There are old apple varieties thought to have been lost and extinct being rediscovered every single day. So the Harrison ended up being one of the focuses of one of the chapters of my book. And you can see why that story is so rich in history. 
So I wanna go through a few of the other chapters and things I talked about by region. Some of these things are gonna hit close to home and some of them um, you might see if you end up traveling around the country as well. So I went to the Coachella Valley in Southern California. And although most people today associate it with the music festival by the same name, historically it was famous for its date palms. Now date palms are a non-native crop. They were brought here in the 19 teens by a team of USDA scientists who call themselves the food explorers. They traveled the world, bringing back better versions of crops already familiar to American farmers or seeking out entirely new crops to grow in new areas. They realized that the climate of the Coachella Valley was extremely similar to the Arabian Peninsula, which was famous for its date gardens. It's very hot. Um, often there are over 100 days, over 100 degrees every single year. There's very little rain, but there's quite a bit of underground water. So in the 19 teens, the government supported small farmers moving into this area to irrigate the desert and grow date palms. Now, this is still primarily where dates in America are grown. We grow about as many dates within our, our countries as we import. But what is really interesting to me is because these were small family farms, they often developed their own new date varieties that can now be found nowhere else on the planet. So one of the ones that I tried that I really like is from a family farm called Shields Date Garden. They've been around since the 1940s and they have what are known as blonde beauty dates that are a semi-dry, semi-sweet date. And so they have both the texture and flavor of a really good buttery caramel. I also talked to a man named Sam Cobb, who is a new date farmer and is developing new date brands, um, date varieties, like one he calls Safari, which is actually a little bit of a savory date. You could order from both of those companies online. But one of the most interesting things to me about this story is that California is a place that loves to sell fantasy, loves to sell travel without leaving the borders of the United States through Disneyland, Hollywood, and in the case of the Coachella Valley, for many years in the 20th century, they decided to do this whole Arabian night slash biblical themed week, festival week. And often many of the date gardens were themed uh, and would be in the shape of like an Egyptian um, pyramid or a nomad's tent and have all these sort of like mashed up Middle Eastern references too. So I do a lot of unpacking of that and the fact that certain elements of this festival still exist in the 21st century. I also got to go to Hawaii and I researched the story of Hawaiian sugarcane. So the story of sugar is basically this. It uh, evolves in Papua New Guinea. That's the first place about 10,000 years ago that human beings started cultivating it and breeding it. One single variety of sugarcane went west from uh, Papua New Guinea to India, India to Persia, then to the Muslim empire around the Mediterranean. And then uh, in the time of American colonization, it ended up in the Caribbean. But Hawaii is part of what's known as the Polynesian Triangle, uh, a rough triangle that extends from Papua New Guinea to Hawaii to New Zealand in the south. And these are thousands of islands that were populated by the same seafaring group of people, the Polynesians. Anytime these Polynesian ocean voyagers, the wayfinders as they were known, set out to populate a new island, they bring with them certain what are now known as kapuna crops or elder crops, uh, key items to their food waves. And sugarcane was one of them. It's important for its carbohydrates as well as the potassium contained inside, but it was also used in decorating and building structures. It was used in ritual magic and medicine and even in traditional Polynesian tattoos. So while there is only one variety of sugarcane in most of the world, there are at least 42 different varieties in Hawaii, which you can see all look remarkably different from the very, very deep kind of purple black one on one side to this incredible cane that's called Ha'ali'i, which is this pink and yellow striped one here. And of course, Hawaii was known for its sugar refining industry as well. At one time, it, uh, it produced the most sugar per acre of any spot in the entire world. Um, this is the site of the first sugar refinery in Hawaii. Um, and you can see like written very faintly there, it says it all started here. This is on the island of Kauai, and this is the Kohala uh, sugar refinery, sugar mill. But actually the last sugar mill in Hawaii closed in 2016, that one was on Maui. And today the largest sugarcane growers are actually two distilleries 
that turned native Hawaiian sugar cane into a product called rum agricole, rum that's fermented from pressed sugar cane juice, not from sugar. So the story gets really, really complicated about who's, you know, it's a culturally important item to Hawaiian people, but now it tends to be largely non-Hawaiians who are using this, this crop. I also went to the Navajo Nation, that's the reservation around the Four Corners region in the Southwest, to learn about the Navajo churro sheep. Now, looking at them right away, you can see this, this is actually a goat on the right side here. <laughs> they hung out, they hang out with goats and even guard alpacas as they were known. Um, in the 70s, alpacas were trained, they're very territorial. So like once you sort of get them to hang with the sheep, they'll protect the sheep at all costs from coyotes and wolves and other predators out in the, uh, in the high desert. Um, you can see they come in many different colors, actually about two dozen different colors from the sort of lavender gray to deep brown to black and pure white. Um, and you can see, even see already some of their amazing sets of horns. But what is so unique about this animal is that they're known as polycyrate. Polycyrate means that they can have four, six, or even eight horns. Oh, and I see questions coming in the Q&A. Drop them in there at any time. I'll get to all of them at the end, but if something pops in your head, don't be afraid to just put it in there. Um, these animals have been a part of Navajo culture for about 400 years. Um, they've been selectively bred over that time and to be uniquely adapted to the arid climate, the difficult conditions of the American Southwest. They are really good mothers too, They're, and really good foragers. And their hair is really unusual in that it has a short, thick undercoat and then this really, really long, up to 14 inches long overcoat. They're also very low in lanolin, that oil in sheep's wool. So all these things together make them ideal for weaving. And it's their wool that traditional Navajo weavings and blankets are made from. But also the taste of this sheep's meat is the taste of home for most Navajo people. Mutton and uh, organ meat, everything associated with sheep is very, very sacred and important to Navajo culture. But on two different occasions, the American government tried to eradicate these sheep. It's only been since the 1970s that the population has become stable as well as protected within America and accepted as an important part of Navajo culture. I went to the Pacific Northwest to experience Salish reef net fishing. Salish reef net fishing is a about, about 10,000 year old indigenous fishing technique that is absolutely brilliant. First of all, looking at this image, I was in the, the Salish Sea is the most northern part of the Puget Sound. Um, it uh, basically the sea exists around the international border between the United States and Canada. And it's traditionally fished by the Salish people, which are indigenous peoples whose um, territories were largely um, on the ocean or on the sound, as opposed to along a river or a lake. So while salmon fishing is incredibly important to all of the native tribes of the Pacific Northwest, the Salish people specifically adapted fishing techniques um, to fish in open water, as opposed to those rivers and sounds. So this is what a modern gear looks like. Here's a historical gear. Um, the way this fishing method works is ingenious. So historically it is two, I'm gonna get my laser pointer out, hang on, hang on. Stationary canoes, now it's two stationary platforms with a net strung between them. And then this long part here, this is called a reef. It's not exactly a net, it's really a series of ropes that are anchored to the floor of the sound and then decorated with um, grasses so that it looks, it appears as though it's the floor of the sound, even though the reef is actually guiding schooling salmon right up here into the net. These are stationary gears. You can see that they're anchored and they're basically parked in the path of schooling salmon. Uh, when I visited the Salish Sea, these gears are in front of the opening to the Fraser River, which is one of the largest um, salmon spawning rivers in the Pacific Northwest. Salmon are Andromedus, which means that they are born in freshwater, live their lives in saltwater, and then return to the freshwater where they were born to breed again. So the fish are caught because there's someone called a spotter, either standing on the front of the canoe or today in tall crow's nests. And they are looking into this crystal clear water, waiting for the schools of salmon. When they see a school of salmon swimming into the net, they give the call, the net is pulled up on deck, and there you have it. 
Today, this is considered an invaluable fishing method because it is very protective of um, non-targeted species, species that are protected, like uh, the king salmon, which is becoming increasingly rare. Since the fish are pulled from the net live onto the, the flat piers today and into a live well, it's very easy to, to sort out the salmon species that might school with non-protected salmon, but are protected species and need to go upriver to spawn. It also delivers extremely good tasting meat because the fish um, and a lot of fishing methods, they're either they get trapped in nets and die or they're thrown on deck or directly in ice to suffocate. This creates a lot of stress in the animal and leaves a um, not a very good looking or good tasting product. These fish are de-stressed. They die floating, swimming around in water. They're very relaxed. The product looks beautiful and tastes really remarkable as well. Today, this is only practiced in a very small region, um, whereas historically there were hundreds, if not thousands of indi indigenous fishing gears throughout the, the Salish Sea. I also went to the upper Midwest to study Ashinabeg wild rice. I tried to pick chapters that really surprised me and two things really surprised me about wild rice. First of all, it's not actually rice. Its closest relative is corn. And second of all, it is indigenous to the United States and to the Great Lakes region. I grew up near Cleveland. I grew up near Lake Erie. And this was a food that allegedly grew in the place that I grew up. And I had never heard about it before or really realized it was an American ingredient. It's most heavenly harvested in the areas um, that are bright green. So it's a traditional and sacred food source uh, in Michigan, particularly the Upper Peninsula, Wisconsin, Upper Minnesota, and even into North Dakota as well. It grows in sort of shallow marshy areas uh, along bodies of fresh water. And one of the things that has greatly affected the territory of wild rice are things like pollution and waterfront industrialization. Certainly in my home of Cleveland, that was one of the things that affected wild rice's presence. Um, the bright green, too, is also the location of what's known as northern wild rice, which is the kind that's most commonly harvested. The dark green is what's known as southern wild rice, which is um, equally edible, but it's a taller and more difficult plant to harvest. Additionally, even though up in these areas of Maine and Vermont and New Hampshire, you can see that there's northern wild rice. Um, there are not really traditional, uh, it's not really considered a traditional food uh, amongst indigenous groups there. Although today there are people who are actively harvesting in those regions um, just to be able to enjoy this wild food. It's harvested off of lakes by hand. For the most part, what we're buying in the store is actually not true wild rice. And in fact, in Minnesota, in Wisconsin, there is legislator, legislature preventing um, what is known as cultivated wild rice. I know it sounds a little nuts um, from being labeled as wild rice. There it has to be called cultivated wild rice or even paddy rice. It is grown in patties, not in a wild environment. It's been selectively bred to be large, uniform, um, and it's harvested by machine as opposed to true wild rice, which even from one end of the lake to the other can have um, a different shape, a different color, a slightly different taste. It's an immensely genetically diverse plant. And it is still today harvested by the traditional com communities of the Ashinabeg, particularly the Ojibwe, which live in most of those green highlighted areas as well. And we did talk a little bit about heirloom cider apples, but I just want to share this mind-blowing statistic. Um, today, in our average grocery store, we'll find about 100 apples. Not at the same time, but there's about 100 different varieties of apples that are grown commercially. There are about 45,000 different apples grown all across the United States in large or small amounts. But there was a survey done at the turn of the 20th century by the USDA, and that survey actually counted at that time that there were 14,000 unique varieties. So we've lost somewhere in the neighborhood of 11,000 different apple varieties, some of which have been recovered. And there are a couple organizations throughout the country that are actively looking to find these apples. In the Pacific Northwest, there are people who study um, old land maps to find old orchards and then go hiking through the woods to find them. In South Carolina, there's a man named Tom Brown who has basically created an incredible community across the South and calls people saying, hey, have you seen any apple trees? You know any apple trees? And has discovered thousands of apple trees that were thought to be lost. 
So you've got a lot of great orchards up there in Vermont. You've got a lot of great cider makers up there in Vermont. It is absolutely worth it to get to those orchards and cider makers. This is this is sort of what the American wine industry could have been. It was really temperance that sort of stopped cider making, but it's coming back in a big way. Um, about a decade ago, there were less than 100 cider makers across the country. Now there's more than 1,000. Um, I will, okay. I'm, I, we might have to Google to uh, back them up, but Eden Cider Maker, I believe, is in Vermont. Um, incredible cider maker, woman-owned. They also have a ice cider, which is kind of like an ice wine. It's a little bit like a dessert wine. It is sweet, but you just get the most pure, intense apple flavor out of it. Um, there is another female and Black-owned cider maker in Burlington. Krista Scruggs is the cider uh, maker's name. We'd have to look up what it is called. I cannot remember. And then there is an orchard called, I think, Orphan Hill Orchery with also an attached cider maker as well, um, who's doing some incredible stuff in Southern Vermont too. So Vermont has got it going on in terms of cider. Um, and it's also makes, I think, a really nice Christmas gift and uh, a really nice regular party, as opposed to a bottle of wine. It's like, come with a 750 of cider. It's really unique and exciting. And usually comes with a good story too. I also went to Louisiana to investigate Choctaw Filet Powder. This is an ingredient incredibly important to Cajun and Creole cuisine. Um, Creole cuisine is largely centered around New Orleans. Cajun extends really from um, Houston all the way to New Orleans as well, um, throughout what's known as Acadiana. Now it's made with sassafras, which I actually pointed out. You know, it's a it's a very common tree in the Eastern United States, but as an ingredient, it's highly localized. So some of the foods on the Ark of Taste are endangered on the verge of extinction. And some of them are rare because they're so much a part of a very local community. This is not really used outside of the Gulf Coast and a little bit of the Gullah Geechee culture in South Carolina and Georgia. Um, filet is ground dried sassafras leaves. There's a traditional method of making it, which is sort of dying out. But at the same time, people are just sort of innovating. They're drying out leaves um, in a pillowcase in their dryer and then pulverizing it in their uh, food processor, as opposed to drying them in a hot, dark place and then using a, a giant African style hand carved wood mortar and pestle to grind it. So it's a little bit too about, you know, is it okay traditions change? It's both a flavorant, it has sort of a citrusy flavor as well as a thickener. And unlike any thickener I've ever had, creates this very silky, smooth emulsion. And that's how it's usually used as a thickener in gumbo. On the left, this is a sassafras tree that's been very heavily har harvested. It's a filet making tree. So every year, a lot of its new growth gets chopped off and dried, drying the leaves on the branches that is the traditional way to do it until it kind of looks like a tree from a Dr. Seuss drawing. And then on the right, this is traditional gumbo filet, um, which when you put enough filet powder in it, kind of turns it a little bit green. And the last story I think is one of the most remarkable. It's of the Carolina African runner peanut. Um, peanuts are actually from South America, from an area called the Pantanal, which is the world's largest wetland. They went to the old world, Europe, Africa, and Asia in the Columbian Exchange. That's the back and forth of plants and animals after first contact was made in 1492. Or let's say acknowledge first contact, because I think there, it's definitely been proven that both uh, the Vikings hit uh, uh, somewhere in Canada, and actually that those Polynesian wing finders also made landfall in South America too. But the 16th century was an opening of trading routes back and forth. Um, the peanuts ended up in uh, West Africa, where interestingly, there was another very similar plant. The peanuts sort of replaced it because they were tastier, easier to grow. And then the peanuts came back to North America with the enslavement of trafficked Africans. They were packed on the ships of the enslavers because they were a very easy food source that West Africans were familiar with. And so for a long time, they were grown exclusively in the gardens of the enslaved both as a food for themselves, but also by the 19th century, um, both free and enslaved African-Americans were selling roasted peanuts on the streets of the South major cities as a way to make some extra money for themselves and their families. They were given passes uh, by their enslavers to go do that. Um, one example 
in addition to the the roasted peanuts um was there was a treat called um peanut cakes uh charleston uh peanut cakes and they're sort of they're not really a cake they're a candy almost like a peanut brittle but made with molasses and sometimes a little butter and cream too they were sold off of trays um uh, with parchment paper just like you see here um along with a few other sweets and often particularly for black free black women this is how they made a living and supported their families now what's so remarkable about this is that although this was considered probably the tastiest peanut in American history, by the 1930s, it was thought to be extinct. It is kind of a smaller peanut. So as the process of peanut farming became mechanized in the 20th century, the industry switched to larger peanuts and these sort of fell by the wayside, even if they were the best tasting ones. Um, they were believed to be lost until about 20 years ago, a scholar named David Shields was asked by a local entrepreneur to research and then locate the long lost ingredients of the Carolina Rice Kitchen. The Carolina Rice Kitchen is the cuisine of low country South Carolina, the area around Charleston, um, that was based around a local ingredient, Carolina Gold Rice, which has also since been revived. Um, David Shields thought this project was going to take six months. Uh, and like I said, when I talked to him, he'd been working on it for 20 years. First, he identified missing ingredients, largely by looking at seed catalogs from the past. And then he tried to track them down. The Carolina Runner Peanut, he thought, was one that was gone, was absolutely lost. Until he got a tip that at the University of North Carolina, um, they had a peanut collection in their cold storage that had been started in the 1930s right around the time when the Carolina runner peanut dis was disappearing. And so he called and said, hey, I'm looking for Carolina runners. Do you have any? The guy said, give, you, give me one second. Let me look. Comes back on the phone and says, yes, we have 24. 24 individual peanuts, which are also the seeds of peanuts. David Shields convinced them to send 12 of them to South Carolina, and they put them in the ground. And as far as what happens, you'll just have to read the book. These are the major chapters, but just some of the stories. I cover different ingredients in the intro and the conclusion. I think the conclusion might be one of my favorite chapters. And the deeper I got into each one of these stories, it felt like they just kept connecting to other rare American foodways. About half of these stories are about indigenous communities, but not all. But I did find that rather significant and remarkable that many of these foods that were disappearing were part of indigenous communities. And I really wanted to know why. So I'm going to get into some of your questions. I see there's things here in the q and I'll check the chat too, but if you've got questions, now is a great time to put them in the Q&A. All right, I'm going to take a sip of my coffee here. It's still early in Las Vegas. I know it's cocktail hour for you. Mm. So Jenny wants to know, what are the most surprising things you found? And what are the lost foods that you most wish we still had? Honestly, I like I said, I picked things that surprised me that were really unexpected. I'll tell you the story from the conclusion. Um, it is a story from my home state of Ohio, and it is about this lovely little chicken um, called the Ohio Buckeye Chicken. If you're a sports fan, you know the, the Ohio State Bucks, the Buckeyes. Um, the Buckeye is a relative of the, uh, the chestnut tree. Um, and so, you know, just the story behind it was fascinating to me because it's the only poultry breed whose creation has been credited to a woman. In all the poultry breed breeding and of all the types of birds out there, only one woman has been credited for creating a breed. And luckily, since the breed was created in the early 20th century, we have quite a bit of writing from her and she was a real firecracker. And because of this female legacy, it also tends to be a breed where the, the breeding is dominated by women who feel a kinship with that legacy. So every story is just, yeah, it was something that just felt personal and surprising. And as far as foods that are gone, you know, I was just having a conversation with a friend of mine, a chef friend of mine, um, because um, aurochs have been revived. Aurochs are an ancient wild cattle species that we've now been able to breed backwards. And now there's even some talk of um, using not just maybe backbreeding, but genetic information to bring back passenger pigeons. 
Um, up through the 19th century, there were literally billions of passenger pigeons in the United States, and they were hunted to extinction, unbelievably. They were a major food source in America up until the late 19th century when they were near extinction. And then I believe the last one was shot in the 1920s or something like that. Uh, and then there was a museum specimen in Cincinnati, Ohio, I think in the 1930s. Um, so there's a possibility that we would have genetic material to bring back this animal that was both a, a food source for both a high low, like much like an oyster, both a food source that everybody ate. Everybody was eating passenger pigeon. Um, that And also a major part of our ecosystem that vanished, you know, billions of birds. The stories would say that flocks of passenger pigeons would black out the sky. So what would that mean to have that back, to have that animal back in our landscape? I think that's something I'm really curious about and, and I'm following that story. Okay, Elizabeth, how did you decide what to include given the sheer volume of information on limited stories? Yeah, other than something that surprised me, it's as I was going through the archetypes entries and really like one day I had had the idea, I, it was time to put together a proposal to pitch it to my agent and my editor. And I said, okay, today I'm going to sit down with the Ark of Taste. You know, I think at the time there were 350 entries and now there's over 400. And I'm just going to read. I'm going to click through. And it was this process of editing down. There are like a lot of tomatoes on the Ark of Taste. And that's, that's nice. But most of the tomatoes didn't have a particularly engaging story. And it got down to this place where I was like, well, which ones do have this deeper history that is both engaging, says something important, represents a region, is a little different than the other stories I'm telling, but also can fill a full chapter. And honestly, it wasn't as hard as it sounds. Things just seem to fall into place. And certainly like, I think I pitched this as like a 10 chapter book as opposed to eight and the chapters ended up being so long I, I cut it down to eight but some things got moved around because sometimes when you start pulling the thread of what seems like an interesting story you kind of hit a dead end it's not as big as you thought it was but also luckily I'm going to start writing for Gastro Obscura and I'm going to be producing a monthly column about rare and endangered foods and I can get into some of the, the the shorter stories that didn't that weren't big enough for a whole chapter of a book and didn't end up in the book too so I'm looking forward to that hello Ellen am I familiar with the gillfeather turnip named for Vermont Jack gillfeather in the 1860s Vermont official vegetable okay I love that I heard it mentioned at the top of this and I have to say it was curious so, okay, here is what makes me extra curious. I'm just going to open up a new window. Um, let's go to Ark of Taste. And I'm going to look up Gilfeather Turnip because if it's not on the Ark of Taste, it absolutely should be. And we need to reach out to the appropriate people to get it on there. Okay, Gil, two L's or one L? Let me pull up the Q&A again. One L. Gil, oops, Feather. Now it's a zero of zero. Let me try, I'm gonna try the filter really quick. At condition where, so you're getting a whole demo. Abstract projects, I mean, let's see what turnips are on there. Turnip. Your state turnip is not on the arc of taste. So then the next thing I would do is slow food Vermont because they need to get on it. We are the local chapter of Slow Food. These are the people that's one if someone needs to write an email and get into this process of how do we onboard the gill feather turnip because it is clearly very local and very important to you and it should be recognized outside of Vermont. So this is where you start. There's the contact right there. Uh, don't be angry, you know, give them a chance, but then you'll get the opportunity to work with the Slow Food representatives. Oh, here's my cat to um, onboard this item to the Ark of Taste. He's always helping my talks. Thank you, Patty. Mm -mm -mm. So I'm not, I'll have to, you know what, I have a friend who is a avid gardener. Um, she lives about an hour south of Burlington. I will get her to put some gill feather turnips in the ground. You're so welcome, Ellen. All right, my favorite Pascal celery, practically the one grown in Denver, Colorado. No, the local Italian farmers had special farming te techniques. Yes, trenching and blatching, that I am familiar with, the result of unique flavor, highly desired by the Italian community in Denver. Blah, blah, blah. Not a bit. Okay, so yes, celery was entirely different in the 19th century. It was an incredibly popular vegetable, but also not only were there different varieties, just like James is talking about, James Gardner, great name. Um, it was grown in a different way. Um, the kind of like we grow leeks. So you either piled up dirt or they would create these blanching boards 
that the celery would be um, sort of pale and tender and sweet. And if you um, piled up dirt, the outer edges would actually kind of rot. So you would sort of like pull them away and then just have this young tender core. So I am obsessed with how celery was grown historically and also how now it's just such a like iro vegetable, whereas it had a hugely important place in the dinner tables of the 19th century. So someday I'm going to research what happened to celery. This would be a great pitch for gastro obscura um, and maybe try to grow my own trenched and blanched celery. Um, have I read The Land of Milk and Honey and Evil Set in the Future? We're lost with the resurrected. Woolly Mammoth. No, I'm going to put it on my reading list. I need some good books for Christmas break. Thank you for the recommendation, Elizabeth. The Land of Milk and Honey for anyone else that is interested. Hello again, James. In your research, did you note any general themes that contributed to the extinction of these foodstuffs? Yes. Colonization, uh, genocide, breaking of people's food traditions. With indigenous communities, it had a lot to do with how the American government was treating indigenous peoples because the idea was to erase assimilate and colonize. And one of the ways to do that is to break people's connection with their local food sources. So the reservation system, moving people off their traditional lands, that wasn't just because the American government wanted those lands. It's because when you move someone physically, you break off their connection with their local foods. And that can even mean crops too. If like uh, South Florida to Oklahoma, if you move to an entirely different climate, you can't even grow the same plants, let alone forage a lot of the same plants too. Too. And then the government would help by offering things like sugar, white flour, um, pork, and coffee, these very anglicized foods, because being Anglo-European, especially through the early 20th century, was seen as the only way to be American. So there's a lot of resilience, hope, community uh, amongst Indigenous people, and they are become very lit becoming very litigious, as well as very involved in both local and the federal government. And so through this sort of like extended hope and investment in their stories and traditions, um, that's why there's become a major preservation movement, because it's not just about the food, it's also about um, their cultural heritage. So that is definitely the most common one, all the effects of colonization. I think I got all the questions. Is there anything? Oh, thank you for dropping all of these lists in the links in the chat too. Um, wonderful. Well, everyone, this was a real treat. Happy cocktail hour. The book is of course available anywhere books are sold. Um, and I believe the links go to bookshop.org. Ooh, any opinions on how we can deindustrialize our food? Ellen, oh, a big question because um, a lot of, um, a lot of the solutions were given, like go shop at your local farmer's market. That is an individual solution to, as you said, uh, as you just framed it, it's a, it's a systematic problem, right? We need to fight for not just us with access in terms of, uh, I've got a car and I can drive to the farmer's market. There is a farmer's market not too far away. I can afford to pay a premium for certain vegetables that both taste better, but also support far small farmers. Supporting small farmers and eating tasty things is a great thing to do. But um, not everybody has that access or that privilege, right? So how do we change a more equitable uh, to make the food system more equitable for everybody? Um, I do think it can happen. And here is one very small way that I've seen it happen. If you've ever met anyone from New Mexico, they will tell you about their hatch chilies. It is a local New Mexican native chili that is a really important part of the culinary culture down there. McDonald's in New Mexico gives you the option to top your hamburgers with red or green hatch chilies. So if an international multi-billion fast food company will make this adjustment to fit into the local food landscape, that means that this is not an insurmountable task. It just needs more pressure from us. So legislation, I think, is one of the biggest things. And what I do when something feels very big or overwhelming is I send money to individual organizations, especially amongst individual uh, indigenous communities. There are a lot of people working on the ground to preserve native foods. Um, there are a lot of organizations that support black farmers in America, which have been systematically um, oppressed and overlooked for loans, even though agriculture is a traditional uh, African-American way of life here. 
Um, there are organizations within your state that are helping local farmers and growers. There are classes that you can take to learn how to forage. And of course, there are food organizations working to bring equitable food into what are now known as food apartheid, um, places where uh, poor communities where good food was intentionally made under unavailable as another form of oppression. So it's a really, really big thing. So I always say, you know, focus small and local and send money. There are people out there doing good, good work. And plant a garden if you've got the space. I, for the first time, have a backyard. So a garden's going in this year for sure. Anything to add? Brattleboro Literary Festival? You were muted if you're trying to say anything. There we Sorry, go. coughing attack. Um, I had a question about um, how do hybrids, is a hybrid considered, uh, can it become, become extinct or is a hybrid considered a, a different kind of food entirely? Than a uh, native food? No, I mean, a hybrid just means it's a cross between two other varieties, you know, <laughs> so like a John of Gold apple is a cross between a Jonathan and a uh, Golden Delicious. So, you know, it's a very, very general term. Um, we tend to hear that word today a lot associated with like agribusiness and, um, you know, patenting of seeds. And honestly, it's just within certain crops, hybrids don't, can't, don't produce viable seeds. Like that's true with corn across the board um, and have to be sort of rehybridized every year, but that's not true of everything. So even though it's a very sort of loaded word with, within agribusiness, there are definitely other hybrids you're eating. Hybrids are not just GMO, they can be produced through traditional breeding methods. Some of them are very old, some of them are very new. It really is just sort of a case by case basis. Got it. The only thing that slow foods say is that, that their foods have to be free, meaning that it is a food that anyone could grow and raise themselves if they wanted to. Got it. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Those stories are just totally amazing and quite a revelation. Thanks. We're big local wars in Vermont here, especially in Southern Vermont. We'll have to send you a box. Oh my gosh, I'd love product. that. Wouldn't that be cool? And from mis visiting my friend, she lives near Middlebury. So I am lucky enough to get a good taste of Vermont foods too. And of course in Ohio, we're not as famous for our maple syrup, but we are a maple harvesting region. And you know, that's a big part of our culture in Northeast Ohio as well. So we've got that in common. And then with my mom, I actually went and visited for her 70th birthday. We went to the King Arthur Flower flagship store and took classes and ate a right. day all weekend. And they often have so many interesting grains. And yeah, so I Vermont is right here next to my heart. I've been many times and we'll be back again many times too. We'll come back and see us in the summer. Yeah, I'd love that. Love Vermont yeah. in the summer. Not much of a winter sports gal myself. <laughs> Um, so our next literary cocktail hour is on January 12th at 5 p.m. with celebrated novelist Virginia Pye and her new book, The Literary Undoing of Victoria Swan. Until then, stay well, stay safe, and have a fabulous holiday.